Supporters of President Donald Trump last night marching on Congress to disrupt the counting of electoral votes at Capitol Hill in Washington. Now, in scenes never seen before, an armed standoff took place between police and rioters on the steps of Capitol Hill. Trump is still refusing to accept defeat in the November election and is being blamed for goading his supporters into this violent action. Now, as Trump clings to power, it is just two weeks until incoming President Joe Biden is to be inaugurated. Let's unpack the story now. We're joined by Capri Cafaro, who is a political analyst and a former member of the Ohio Senate. Capri, good morning. Great to have you with us this morning in South Africa. I mean, we're all shocked. Are we surprised? Uh, shocked but not surprised is definitely how I would describe this. Obviously, these kinds of scenes where you're seeing, uh, you know, armed protesters and uh, members of government uh, donning gas masks and crouching under their desks and guns being drawn and, and windows being broken. Uh, those are not scenes that, that we uh, expect to see coming out of uh, the United States and the U.S. Capitol building, the seat of, of uh, American democracy and arguably, you know, the most powerful superpower uh, on the globe. Uh, is it surprising is a very different question, because I think anyone that has uh, followed American politics over the last five to six years has seen this gradual polarization uh, coming to fruition and really has been embodied in uh, the uh, candidacy and presidency of uh, President Donald J. Trump. And, and certainly his actions, the way that he has uh, approached going into the 2020 election, how he has framed uh, you know, the, the use of mail-in ballots, um, undermining the credibility of the, the election even before votes were started to be cast here, um, uh, and, and now culminating in what we saw today that was supposed to be a protest. And we've seen a number of these protests over the last weeks and months. That is not different. That is you know, part of our culture here. It is part of, of, of dissent and discourse. But this went to a different level. This, this bordered on insurrection where we had individuals go from a protest to interrupting a, a, due, uh, a due course of law where their grievances that they that these individuals claimed that they had about the legitimacy of the 2020 presidential election were being bore out in the democratic process in the house and the senate they interrupted that and chose violence and chaos over order uh, and, a, and a peaceful transfer of power and a peaceful uh, conversation about uh, any questions or grievances they may have had I mean, it's been called, as you say, violent insurrection and attempted coup, domestic terrorists goaded by the president. So the question that Mitt Romney asks the Senate floor in the wake of these protests is, how do we convince these Trump supporters? And he says, no congressional audit is ever going to convince these voters, especially when the president keeps telling them the election was stolen. That's right. And, and I think that is, frankly, the number one challenge that the United States is currently facing, because uh, as we just discussed, this is not an issue that happened overnight. And this is not this is not a, a challenge to our nation, to our democracy, to our unity and to our future that we are going to be able to remedy overnight, whether, you know, Donald Trump is president or not, um, whether, you know, when when Joe Biden gets uh, sworn in and Kamala Harris is sworn in in about two weeks time, nothing has been able thus far to convince this group of extreme supporters of, of President Trump and his ideology, um, because part of this, I think, lays at the, the feet of another thing that President Trump and uh, social media and other aspects of mainstream media have, have picked up on. And th that is this concept of alternative facts mm -hmm. and fake news. When you latch onto these concepts that facts don't exist and essentially you create your own parallel universe that is an echo chamber that reinforces the, the worldview that you have, it is almost impossible to convince people with facts because they, they only believe the quote facts that they want to believe that reinforce their worldview. So it, it, this is going to be very difficult to undo. There's certainly a lot of responsibility on behalf of, of elected Republican leaders like Mitch McConnell, like Ted Cruz, like, like others that we've seen uh, this evening as, as the Congress reconvened to go through that constitutional duty of, of uh, 
collecting those electoral votes from across uh, the country, we're, we're seeing people back down a little bit mm. and, and dial back the rhetoric. The question becomes, is that, you know, just a thing for today because of this unprecedented circumstance that we've lived through? Or will they treat uh, Joe Biden and Kamala Harris as duly elected leaders of this country. Mm. Still, I don't think that that will convince uh, some of these people. And I think it's going to be very, very difficult. And, and that's where I think we as a nation feel very uncertain right now because we just don't know where this is going to lead and how long this process is going to go on. Yeah, so some White House officials now also uh, tendering their resignations. As you say, uh, many Republicans now also uh, backpedaling now doing the right thing. The question, of course, is where were they over the years of President Trump's lying? And again, Mitt Romney talked about this issue when he was giving that speech there, saying, I'm going to quote from, from, from what he had to say earlier, those who have been objecting to the results of a legitimate election will be forever seen as being complicit in an unprecedented attack on our democracy. They'll be remembered, he says, for their role in this shameful episode and that includes republicans who for weeks who for the past two months have been saying you know what's the harm in indulging trump in pushing this agenda of questioning the election results we now know what the harm is that that's right and, and i think that uh you know in no uncertain terms a number of these individuals that have indulged president trump and some of these extreme supporters what they're doing is they're doing it, you know, for, for purely, you know, selfish and political reasons. They recognize that they have higher aspirations one day for president of the United States or going from the House to the Senate or frankly, even protecting their own current position in the House or the Senate. They know that as a Republican in 2020, 2021, you need the Trump coalition to win or you're going to be primaried by, by a far right candidate. And, and could potentially lose their job. And so, so many of these individuals that have been complicit have done so uh, essentially for their own, you know, to their own personal um, uh, ambitions and putting those ahead of uh, the strength of our democracy and the tenets of our constitution. And that, that really is a shame. And maybe, um, you know, it took this level of, of um, shock, I think, to the system um, to to set folks straight and recognize that, that this isn't a joke and that just because this is the United States of America, I think a lot of people figured these things don't happen here. It couldn't be possible that people could storm the U.S. Capitol building. Well, it obviously is proven true. And I think that that has really put the fear of God in, in um, many lawmakers recognizing um, just how much uh, our nation and, and our democracy and our institutions have been strained and tested over the last four years. You know, Capri, when we started this interview, we talked about the fact that, you know, we're all shocked by what happened at Capitol Hill, that we're not surprised. If we take a look at some of the things President Trump has said over the past few years, particularly over the past few months, uh, you know, for one, refusing to condemn white supremacy uh, in the Black Lives Matter uh, protest, the president telling the Proud Boys to, quote, stand back and stand by when he was asked whether he would uh, guarantee a peaceful transfer of power if indeed he did lose the November election. He said, well, we'll have to see. How do you see your country recovering from the Trump years in the coming days, let's say, in the coming months? Mm -hmm. Well, well, let me just go back to what I just just said right before that question. And, th and that is the fact that I think it took this kind of shock to the system to make people realize the severity and the seriousness of, of, of this movement and what it's capable of. Because I think previously, as you said, I mean, we've heard President Trump say so many of these things, uh, you know, and over, over the years, all the way back from, you know, Charlottesville in 2017, that you know, there are good people on both sides where there are, you know, white supremacists uh, in, in conflict in Charlottesville, Virginia, um, all the way to that uh, debate where he said, stand back and stand by about the Proud Boys, which are you know another extremist uh, right-wing uh, supremacist group. Um, and, and so a lot of people would say, well, you know, you gotta take Trump's tweets with a grain of salt. Yeah, you know, take, take his actions more than his words. His words are just bluster. And I think there was another camp saying, well, wait a minute, those, those words are coming from the president of the United States. They have force and they have 
uh, you know, they have um, a way of convincing people that wouldn't just be, uh, you know, someone's crazy uncle, as I think Savannah Guthrie from NBC News here in the United States said during one of the town halls. And, and so what I think we've seen now is that there is no, there, there is an unequivocal uh, uh, proof at this point that President Trump's words can and have translated into actions to the point where the leader of the Proud Boys uh, was arrested and banned from the District of Columbia before all of this happened. Uh, and so, you know, these groups that he, that that he's been, um, you know, uh, revving up over the last years, they did show up. They did. They were ready and armed to defend him. And these are groups that that talk about their patriotism, their love for their country, their love for law enforcement. And what we saw today um, or yesterday for, for all of you yeah, yeah. is a, a group of people that came to the, to the nation's capital, uh, abused law enforcement and, and defaced the seat of democracy. And, and that certainly is not what our love of country looks like here in the United States. And, and I'm glad to see so many um, condemning, yeah, even if it is too little too late. Yeah, uh, the president himself, you know, just before his Twitter account was suspended, not going so far as to condemn what happened at Capitol Hill, saying, go home, we love you, you're very special. Yes, um, and and I know that other members. My understanding is reporting at least is saying that other members of his family, like Ivanka Trump, have have uh, referred to these individuals as patriots, and then subsequently deleted those tweets. Um, it certainly sends the wrong message. I mean, we've also heard uh, pretty extensive reporting, for example, that um, it, because of the the uh, the jurisdictional issues of the way the District of Columbia, as our nation's capital, is governed, in order to get certain types of law enforcement and military there. Local officials need to work with the federal government um, and that the Department of Defense was was not fulfilling that request for the National Guard to come in. Um, you know, to me, that's an, an implicit um, support of these type of actions. It took Vice President Pence and members of Congress to reach out to the Joint Chiefs of Staff to get that appropriate law enforcement and military presence there to secure the nation's capital. I mean, th this is this is really just in that regard, you know, again, are you surprised? No, because you can see the entire thesis statement laid out, but to actually see it unfold really is um, a shocking, uh, a shocking sight to see and a shock to the system uh, for our nation's democracy and our state, our station in the world. It is it is harrowing for me as an American to speak to an international audience about um, you know, such a, a, a challenging and, and frankly, you know, shameful and embarrassing time here as well, as we are supposed to be the beacon of democracy, helping other nations be lifted up into democracy. And here we are. Incredible stuff. Capri, it's always a great pleasure talking to you. Thanks so much for staying up, staying awake and speaking to us here in South Africa. Capriya Kafaro is a political analyst and a former member of the Ohio Senate, in fact, as we continue to unpack that developing story unfolding there in the United States.